So I would like to start the session. Uh, I hope you have a great uh, lunch. Uh, I, uh, I extend a warm welcome uh, to the second session of the conference uh, on the theme non-locality, quantum correlation and philosophy of relations on the Buddhist logic. Uh, I'm Tenzin Rabia. Uh, IG staff at Tippett House, and I'm honored to be your uh, moderator. For this session, uh, our privilege has uh, is doubled with the presence of uh, Professor Sisi Royji as our chairperson, along with our esteemed speakers, Dr. Utkarsh Mishraji and uh, Venerable Keshe Doji Damdula, and our Professor Atul Kum. Uh, and Professor Atul Kumarji. Following their insightful presentations, uh, there will be a 15 minutes question and answer session. May I now kindly uh, request our respected chairperson and speakers to join on the stage. Chairperson, yes. How much time I can speak? Uh, so, let's. Chairperson, come on, sir. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. You give me one. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as my colleague, uh, Mr. Kungala, has already introduced our chairperson, Professor Sisi Roy, um, let me save time and take over, uh, and let me save time and request uh, our chief, uh, our chairperson, uh, Professor Sisi Roy G to take over this session. Thank you. Good afternoon. And uh, after such a good lunch, I think most of the people might sleep here. And uh, I would request uh, the speakers to make it uh, <laughs> such a presentation so that they will okay wake up. Uh, now, let me start the session, and uh, we have three speakers. So the topic, uh, as it is mentioned, uh, non-locality, quantum correlations, and uh, you know, metaphysics of relations in Buddhist philosophy. Quantum correlations or non-locality has become a very important topic and important phenomena in understanding the behavior of microscopic entities. Basically, I mean roughly the idea is that you take uh, at least two entities and uh, between the two entities there is a kind of uh, relations and this relation or quantum correlation is different from what you found in classical domain or classical mechanics. Why uh, we have clubbed together with uh, these quantum correlations and uh, the physics of or metaphysics of relations in Buddhist philosophy? Because apparently they seem to be a different kind of phenomena, but uh, if you look in a deeper way that uh, because of non-locality there is a kind of 
relations between two entities. So, issue is that whether how far this relation is real or uh, this relation is uh, uh, real in the sense that whether they can be verified as I told in my keynote address experimentally. It is found that uh, in quantum teleportation experiments, uh, this kind of correlations or non-locality has been verified experimentally. So, in physics, we have a relation which is real, in the sense, distestable in lab experiments. Now, uh, in Buddhist philosophy, Dharmakriti, who uh, wrote a book called Metaphysics of the Sammandha Pariksha, or examination of the relations, and he wanted to show that in the ultimate sense, the relation is not real. It raises a lot of debates among other logicians and philosophers from different Hindu schools, Bhartohari, Utpalacharya, uh, then even Jain scholar Prabhachandra, he also involved in this debate. So uh, now some quantum physicists from Switzerland and some European physicists, they are also become interested from uh, philosophical perspective. But they don't, they are, <coughs> most of them, they told me, they are not aware of uh, Eastern traditions. They tried to analyze it from Western traditions. But uh, in Buddhist philosophy, as I told, uh, the Samandha Pariksha or philosophy of relation plays a very important role. So today's session uh, raised a very uh, in intriguing question. On the one hand, in quantum physics, we have a relation. It, it's a relation means it has to satisfy some of the propositions. But it is real. In the sense, it can be, it is testable. But what? The main problem is that, as discussed by some other people, that what is ultimate reality? We, we physics or in science, we don't know what is ultimate reality. So we, we have different layers of reality. One layer may be in the classical world, another layer may be in the microscopic domain or quantum world. But when we are able to say that this is the ultimate reality and how we can reach there, whether through uh, using causality principle, we can reach to ultimate level. We are not clear at all and we don't know. Maybe a uh, single a big debate can be arranged that what is ultimate reality in science itself. So let me uh, ask the speakers if they can shed some light. I mean, so that they will present in such a way that it is very important phenomena in quantum physics or microscopic domain, but it has the characteristics of relations. And then we have, uh, of course, eminent speaker like Kesela, who might shed new light whether how far it can be compatible with Dharmakirti's uh, idea or, you know, other Hindu scholars. So, maybe let me uh, request Dr. Rutkors Mishra. And I think it is already written, so I will not spend time at all. Uh, let me request him to speak. Oh, yeah. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Utkarsh and I work at the University of Delhi. 
And uh, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers and Professor Roy for giving me this chance to speak in front of all of you. And uh, so my topic is quantum many-body sensors. And uh, it means that we uh, are working on, we are using quantum mechanics to estimate certain physical quantities very precisely. And uh, uh, it is something that we sort of, uh, uh, it is related to estimation, which we uh, all do in our daily life. For example, when I was coming here to this venue, I asked my, uh, uh, asked the program coordinator that how far it is. So it was like, oh, it will take one hour or something like that. So uh, this estimation is something that we uh, do uh, uh, in our everyday uh, life. But uh, for more preci uh, precise uh, uh, things, like uh, giving a more precise uh, value, we use uh, physics. And physics also tell us that you can how precise you can measure it. So there's a limit of precision that uh, we can uh, measure certain quantities, like temperature or, or the frequency. And this is determined by the laws of physics. This is something that I will uh, talk about in this uh, talk. So before that, let me just give what is the uh, quantum metrology. So my talk is about quantum sensor, which is quantum metrology. Uh, so quantum metrology is, a, uh, is about parameter estimation, and which is and metrology is also science of measurement. And the ultimate limit of precision in this task are determined by physics, and uh, the ultimate physical theory is quantum mechanics. So the ultimate uh, limit of precision is uh, governed by the laws of physics. So uh, while preparing this talk, I found few uh, uh, sentences which I like, that the progress of human civilization, in some sense, is a progress of improving the, uh, the precision of measurement. For example, uh, we have become more globalized, and we use trade uh, in which we sort of uh, measure like how far things are, in which direction things are, but also in medicine, uh, we are now able to diagnose, uh, diagnose the thing uh, quite early, detect them quite early, and so that we can uh, provide treatment well beforehand. And uh, the progress is quite uh, well now because we earlier used, let's say, to measure lens, we used a uh, certain way to measure lens, for example, like foot, hand, steps. And now we use more sophisticated tools like uh, vernier calipers, microscope, laser ranging devices, etc. And uh, the philosophy, as uh, some of us were talking about, that improved our life. Our life. So in in same fashion, the knowledge that how precise we can measure now things has uh, greatly improved the life of the people as well. So uh, this is just a, an example that why we need more precise measurements. For example, trade is an example where uh, we sort of uh, need to standardize the thing. So what is the meaning of, let's say, kilo or the distance or the volume? These are now the standard definition for that. Earlier, it was not there. So uh, for example, uh, many devices earlier were used to, let's say, measure the time, the temperature, or the, uh, uh, the, the, the chronometer for the navigation. Certainly, they were not very precise earlier. And now we certainly have a more sophisticated devices. So these are, for example, is the atomic clock, which uses the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the oscillation frequency of cesium atom to measure the time, which is basically the definition of one second. Uh, so, uh, so in this uh, experiment here, uh, this is a trapped cesium atom, uh, which is basically the, the wavelength, and which defines these many oscillations of the cesium atom between the two ground states, uh, between the ground state and the excited state. And these oscillations are so precise that it defines that what is the definition of one second. Uh, similarly, we have now to measure temperature, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the radiation uh, sensors which can measure the temperature as well. And also we have uh, uh, the, the GPS system, which can give us a hint to navigate from one place to another place. So they are more precise. 
So this uh, is basically a general picture. Now, why we use quantum mechanics to uh, make sensors or sensing devices? So one of the property that also have been talked in this uh, conference is that the quantum systems are very sensitive to any small perturbation, which uh, somebody termed as decoherence. They're very sensitive, it means that, uh, so this picture is, a, uh, uh, is not actual picture of atom, but this you can think of as a uh, cartoon of an atom, where there are electrons surrounding the nucleus, they are, they are orbiting around the nucleus, and this is a quantum system. I'm calling atom as a quantum system, which is true. So, uh, so this atom uh, are very sensitive to any small perturbation, and therefore, we can use them as a sensor. For example, here we have a lot of atoms which are moving and which determine the temperature of this room. So if we have a quantum sensor here, which will detect the motion and give us the temperature. If the room is hot, then the atoms will move faster. So uh, we can use quantum sensor here as well to measure the, the temperature more precisely of this room. So uh, let's consider a two-level system. So two-level system means that we have some, uh, the atom is in the ground state and the atom is in the excited state. So these are two level of these atom. And the, the E is the energy different between these two levels. And H cross is the Planck constant and omega naught is the frequency. So in general, this atom can be in the zero state or in the one state as well as in the superposition of zero and one state. However, if we have some signal that we want to estimate, it is coming from, let's say, temperature or uh, the frequency or the field, then the state of the system will change as, as this way. So there will be theta here imprinted in this state. And uh, how we will access this theta is our task. So our task is that we want to access this theta here. And because uh, we, we don't have a direct way to access theta, we have to perform this experiment many, many times and collect the data. And this data is collected in terms of the probabilities. So here P is the probability that uh, we have the state uh, of this form, while if there is no perturbation, then we have a state without any theta. So it, it is just the ratio of two, uh, these two events. And P is also related to theta as like one minus cos theta over two. So delta theta gives us the limit by which we can measure the precision of uh, this unknown parameter. And N is the number of times we repeat the experiment. So you can see that since N is fi uh, not infinite, we don't have infinite resources, we have finite resources. So there's a limit in the estimation of this unknown parameter theta. So uh, this gives us uh, the, the limit that we cannot uh, measure any, you know, any parameter like temperature very precisely, there, there will always be an error in, this, in, the, in the measurement. And that error is coming from the, uh, is not that our instruments are very badly built or we are very ignorant. It is just the theory that we are using uh, has this property that we cannot precisely uh, estimate the probabilities and in terms we cannot precisely uh, estimate the unknown parameter that we want to uh, uh, that we want to know so uh, let's so earlier we used one uh, atom now we have many atoms let's say in the all in the ground state and we create an entanglement uh, between the atoms and then we start uh, using sensing it turns out that, uh, so if we ignore uh, these details, it turns out that the error in the estimation is quite improved. It means that now because of this presence of entanglement, we can now measure the theta with a precision which goes as one over n, where n is the number of atoms that we are using. So earlier it was one over root n, which is slower than what we have now is one over n. So it shows that the presence of quantum entanglement can certainly gives an advantage in the precision of measurement. So we can overcome the limit that was earlier. So the earlier we had a limit in the error, which was delta theta goes as one over square root of n. 
And now, because of entanglement, we are able to overcome that limit and give uh, and gives this precision delta theta is equal to one over n. So yeah, this is the ultimate precision that uh, physics, quantum physics can give us in the measurement of some unknown parameter. Uh, so these techniques has been used, for example, in making atomic clocks, magnetometers, so people here are aware of MRI, which detects the anomalies in our brain, so they use this, uh, the, the magnetic field detection. The magnetic field resonance is a, is a mechanism wi by which the anomalies in our brain is detected in medicine. So there are, there are sort of application of this field also in the, uh, in the medicine direction, also in the gra gravitational wave detector. So uh, people have used uh, entangled state and they have gone to very high precision. So these are the few applications that I have listed of quantum sensing. So please tell me when my time is over because yeah, okay, we'll... I have a lot of slides. So, uh, so the theory of uh, quantum sensing is quite broad and the limit, so these two great people, uh, Trammer and Rao, uh, so Professor Rao has passed away recently but he is a great statistical physicist, uh, mathematician who has contributed greatly in, this, in the direction of uh, uh, parameter estimation. So the quantum camera raw inequality, the first line tell us that we cannot exactly estimate any unknown parameter. There is always a bound, and this bound is given by the Kramer raw inequality. So the, the, the quantity in the right hand side is called the quantum Fisher information, which tells us that how much we can know about the unknown parameter. So it means that the higher the quantum Fisher information, if you have higher this quantity, then we know a lot about the parameter. If we have a lower Fisher information, we don't know anything about the unknown parameter. So this characterizes that how much we can know about the unknown parameter. Now in general, uh, we have a quantum state, uh, which is basically the, uh, uh, have all the information. But what we can access is not the quantum state, we can access the classical measurement. So we measure the system and we get the information. That is very general rule. You interact the system, you get the information. But this will limit us our ability to determine the unknown parameter even more precisely. So this classical Fisher information, FC, is less than the quantum Fisher information. So what we know, what quantum mechanics can give is a lot of things, but what we can access using an actual practical implementation is much lower than what the actual uh, theory gives us. So these are two limiting cases. Uh, one is the Heisenberg limit, where the quantum Fisher information scales as n squared, so it's faster, and the standard, uh, standard quantum limit, where the quantum Fisher information scales linearly, which is like slower. So always, if you want to uh, infer the unknown parameter more precisely, we want that the quantum Fisher information uh, uh, scales uh, quadratically with the, with, the, with the number of atoms. Unfortunately, the story is not always easy. I mean, even we have entangled state, there is a decoherence. As we increase the number of particles, the system will no longer remain entangled. The decoherence will destroy its quantum nature. And therefore, the advantage that we might get uh, in quantum metrology or quantum sensing or parameter estimation using entangled state may not be uh, always uh, experimentally accessible. So what is the challenge now? The challenge is now that uh, theoretically we know that this state can give us a uh, very high precision in the measurement in medicine or in the fundamental physics or in making the atomic clocks. So the challenge is that we engineer a quantum state which is free from decoherence. That is the current state of the art in quantum information science that we need such entangled state uh, free of decoherence. We don't need any decoherence to, uh, to perform any important task. So with this, uh, I would like to just uh, uh, you know, thank my collaborators uh, who were contributing in our work. And the picture that I showed were taken from internet, so they were not drawn by me. So uh, thanks to the internet as well. So thank you all for your patience. So thank you, Utkarsh, uh, giving some ideas regarding uh, the role of entanglement in technology. But uh, let me change the program in a little bit, because as we are, uh, many people are here who will be interested in philosophy of relations. So let me request Dr. Atul Kumar.
So he will be able to tell you exactly what is mean by correlations or relations in the domain of quantum theory. Then I will ask uh, Geshela to speak from. <laughs> so you have 15 minutes time. Okay, uh, so okay, let me start uh, by thanking uh, Timber House organizers, uh, Tamdulji, uh, Professor Roy, for inviting me uh, to this address, this August uh, gathering. <coughs> it's always uh, fun to be part of uh, um, the conference in Timber House uh, because uh, you, you uh, get a chance to uh, listen to different people from different perspectives, right? So. Thank you uh, again for that. Just a little bit, <coughs> little bit of advertisement of uh, from where I come. Uh, this is IT Jodhpur. So uh, this is uh, the campus, the first uh, on the uh, top left. And when you enter uh, IT campus, you'll see this brain tree, which signifies life as well as technology in the campus. And then, of course, a uh, little bit of uh, wildlife in the campus. Going back. To the title, uh, I'm going to talk about quantum entanglement and non-locality. Okay. So, um, as in the morning session, it was told that uh, 1925, Schrodinger introduced uh, quantum mechanics as uh, his wave theory. Uh, 1926, basically, and 25, it was introduced uh, as a matrix mechanics by Heisenberg. So. It was a completely new theory, and it puzzled the physicists that time. And you would have heard a lot of times uh, statements uh, like "God doesn't play dice," right? Or, for that matter, Schrodinger said that uh, if uh, this entanglement thing is true, I regret that I have contributed towards it. Feynman even said that I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. So in case you're not able to understand, you're there, okay? And he also said that uh, if you're not perturbed by the findings of quantum mechanics, you have not understood it. So in case you're being perturbed, please be ensured that you're on the right path. So let me start uh, this. Uh, I think Utkars uh, has just uh, told uh, about uh, the states uh, of an atom. He has uh, shown you in terms of energy levels. I'll talk uh, in terms of uh, a coin, right? Let's go back to our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, experience and think in terms of a coin. How, how, how do we say that an electron can be spin up or spin down, right? So if you have a coin, right, it can either be head or a tail. When you toss it, in general, I either get a head or a tail. Quantum mechanically also, there is not much difference. The only thing that we do is we put this head and tail into a bracket, okay? And we say that it's a quantum state. That is what we do. So whenever you are seeing that bracket, that means it's, a, it's just representing a quantum state. So in terms of uh, the spin of an electron, it could be either spin up or spin down. It's a two-level system. Only two possible states are there. But the only difference uh, between uh, quantum mechanics and our classical day-to-day -day experience is in terms of statistics, the probabilities associated with it. What we say is that uh, the coin can also be in a linear superposition of both head and tail. Okay, So how can it be possible? Say, for example, I had this coin, I just I just borrowed it from one of four colleagues, Abhishek. Okay, so this, this is the coin, right? It could, if, if the coin is in my hand, I don't know whether it is head or tail, right? But the moment I perform a toss, right? And it lands into my head, I know whether it is head or tail. So till it is in my hand, I don't know anything about it. Probably coin also doesn't know if it's a quantum coin. But the moment I perform a measurement, when I throw it in the air, I'm forcing it to take a stand. I'm asking it a question, are you head or are you tail? It tells me an answer whether it is tail or head. 
gives me a deterministic answer, but there is a indeterminacy involved until and unless I perform a measurement. So, what I am representing it here is uh, the coin before the measurement, it doesn't know whether it is in the head state or a tail state, but when the measurement is done, you can see it is either a head or a tail. So, what we represent it, how do we represent it? We say that it's a linear combination of both head and tail at one point. Say for example, if I toss the coin, classically it's only head and tail, but what if it stands on the surface like this, right? Like this, right, right like this. I don't know now whether it's a head or a tail. In general, we say there is a 50% probability that you get a head and 50% probability that you get a tail, right? Now that probability comes if you do infinite number of such measurements, create a statistical data for yourself. If, uh, and this, this is how we uh, uh, perform the measurement. Say for example, we don't have to go into detail of this. Uh, this is a stern girl like experiment coming from stern girl like experiment. You pass uh, the electrons through a non-homogeneous magnetic field and depending on whether it is revolving into the clockwise direction or anti-clockwise direction, a translation force acts on this which takes it either up or down depending on whether it is revolving into uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise direction. Now, if, if it was not confusing enough, let's make it more confusing by involving one more particle. Right, where that, that is where the interest comes. That is where you define quantum entanglement, non-locality. You need at least two particles in general to define that, right? So let's go to two-particle system. If I have two coins, then the only possibilities are head-head. If I toss both the coins together, the only possibilities are head-head, head-tail, tail-head, or Tail, tail. Classically, these are the possibilities that exist, right? And as we have already seen for single particle system, quantum mechanically, we can also represent it as a linear superposition of all the four possibilities. Linear superposition is just adding some coefficient to one possibility plus adding another coefficient to another possibility and so on. And these states are normalized. Let's just not go into those details, but this, this is... Uh, 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 it that a two qubit or two particle state, two particle system can be represented like this, right? From here, we will try to <coughs> deduce what quantum entanglement is. So, <coughs> the question that we are asking here say, if we are saying two particle states can be entangled, so is it that all such two particle states which can be written as linear superposition of all the four possibilities are they entangled? Is linear superposition always lead to entanglement? So there are different possibilities that I have written. Let's look at the first possibility. It says head head, the first possibility plus head tail. So here I'm assuming that both C and D are zero, only A and B exist. So in that case, I can write it as H times H plus T, basic factorization, right? That we have learned into our elementary school. Now here, if you look at this state, when you are looking at the right hand side, the first coin has a distinct state that it is in head state. The second coin also has a distinct state that is a standing right on its edge. Right? These are the identities of these two coins. One is in head state and one is standing right on its edge. In the second case, it is exactly the role reversal. Now the first coin is standing on its edge and second is showing you either head or tail, but they have their own distinct identity. Right? In the third case here, when you are taking all the possibilities, HS plus ST plus TH plus TT, still it is H plus T multiplied with H plus T. So first coin is also standing on its edge and second coin is also standing on its edge, right? They both have their distinct identity. They both are standing on their edge. They know what their state is, right? They are standing on their edge. Now let's look at some different kind of uh, possibilities. Now if you have a state which is HH plus TT, now if you look at the first coin, on the left hand side of plus minus, the first coin is either head or tail. Second coin is also either head or tail. Now you cannot separate these two particle like coins, right? Because I'm not able to factorize it 
into the state of the first system and to and the state of the second system in this case the coin both the coins doesn't know whether their state is head or tail it's like they're keep flipping flop keep flip flopping between head and tail until and unless you ask a question the moment you ask a question it will tell you whether it is a head or it is tail but in the first case irrespective of how many times you ask the question if you prepare the similar kind of state every time the first coin tells you that he is in head state the second coin will also tell you that he is also in head state and so on similarly uh, all other cases uh, so uh, one by one i do not uh, want to go into that the point is when you are talking about an entangled state the individual particles they do not have their own identity right it is like they do not they, their individual existence does not exist the state as a whole is defined but when you are looking at individual particles it is not defined in quantum information and uh, computation we call states as pure states or mixed states pure states are states with maximal information that these are all two qubit states and mixed states are states with less than maximal information there are certain degree of uncertainty associated with that those are the states of individual coins here because the individual coin doesn't know whether it is in a head state or a tail state so that contributes towards a degree of uncertainty towards the state of one of the subsystem so that is this kind of states where you cannot write the state as a state of the first system and a state of the system, second system that means the individual particles do not have their own identity as a whole they are defined but as individual identities they are not that is where we call that the state is entangled right this is the algebraic uh, representation of that let's not worry about that alternately let's uh, look at a different picture uh, let's think about two balls one is orange and one is red let's also think that we have two boxes right and in both the boxes we'll put one of these balls right but every time what we do is we put one of the ball in one box and one in another and send it to ellison bob but we ensure that when we are sending the box both the box has same color of the ball right either both of them are having orange or both of them are having red so this is what we are doing and we then we send it to two persons ellison bob now ellison bob before opening the box they don't know they know that box the color of the ball could either be red or it could be orange but before they measure uh, or observe the ball they don't know whether it is red or orange we know about it because of, uh, uh, absolutely uh, clear about it because we these measurements are predetermined for me because i know i have prepared those boxes i have put those balls in the boxes so they will open the box uh, and they will know that uh, uh, they have got uh, some color of the box but every time they will find that if somebody has got a orange ball the other person has also got a orange ball and so on right but this is very classical right now when you talk about atoms atoms are also entangled as we have talked about now think about putting two atoms in these two boxes without knowing what is what are the states of those atoms what are the colors of those atoms right um I, i'm just making some vague statements colors of atom and all just take, trying to take the analogy from what we have discussed so we are putting these uh, uh, balls into the boxes sending one to elise and one to bot bob now i also don't know what is the color of the ball in that box in fact the balls also doesn't know what is the color of the ball until one of them opens it and finds that if it is red the other one is also red and if it is orange then another one is also orange and that's quantum entanglement for me right so this is what uh, uh, puzzled everybody somewhere during 1935 when einstein podolsky and rosen they uh, published uh, this uh, famous paper about epr paradox right einstein podolsky and rosen paradox where they questioned the quantum theory as a complete physical theory i am not going into the detail of the argument that was it was brilliant argument uh, to summarize uh, 
but it was based on uh, locality and realism. Locality means that if you are performing a uh, measurement here, uh, it should not affect in any way uh, uh, another particle at some distant location, right? And realism means that when you are when you perform a measurement to know something, when you observe something, you see something that was existing before you were trying to measure it, right? Like Einstein said that uh, does the moon not exist if I don't look at it? So uh, this was uh, 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 the paper that was uh, published by Anson Porolsky and uh, Rosen based on their assumptions of locality and realism and uh, which was countered by uh, uh, John S. Bell. Basically, he borrowed the same hypothesis of Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen based on locality and realism and gave an inequality which was bearing his name Bell inequality, right? But whatever time I have left, uh, let us just focus on what do we mean by non-local correlation in that case. I'll just try to give you uh, one example. Again, this example I'm taking from Nicholas uh, Jason's book, uh, Quantum Chance, uh, which was shared by uh, Professor Roy with me long back. So uh, in order to understand the difference between these local and non-local correlations, uh, consider that there are two persons, Alice and Bob, which, who are living in a community. And there is one restaurant where they go and eat every night, right? So what happens that every night they end up eating exactly the same meal. Now, how do we explain that? We can explain it in a way that uh, when Alice goes to the restaurant, Bob also comes. Whatever she orders, Bob also copies and orders the same or the other way around, right? So it's like one event influencing the other event, right? But let's make it a little bit more interesting. Let's separate Alice and Bob to two different towns, two different countries or two different galaxies such that they cannot influence each other's choice. Now, assume that there is a restaurant, right? Where Alice goes and there is a restaurant where Bob goes. Now, ultimately what happens is that every evening, although they are in two different galaxies, they end up eating the same menu. Now, how is that possible? Now they are not influencing each other, right? Their choices are not influencing each other's choices. Now, this can be explained by a local common cause. We can still assume that both the restaurants are part of the same chain where the menus of every evening are decided. The menus of every evening are different, but every evening the menu in both the restaurants are same because they are part of the same chain, right? That's also a local explanation because <clears throat> there is a common cause which is propagating from point to point continuously to both the chains, right? So there are two ways in which you can explain that. First was uh, uh, event influencing the other event or with a local common cause. Okay. Now think about a situation because they do not have much choice, right? We said that there is only one restaurant in both the galaxies. Consider there are two restaurants, one on the right and one on the left to both houses. So Alice can choose randomly that I want to take food today in the left restaurant or in right restaurant. Similarly, Bob can also choose the same. Now, one evening they both go to their left restaurant, they end up with the same menu. Okay, You can still explain with the common local cause that both the restaurants are part of the same chain. right? One day Alice decides to go to left, Bob decides to go to right, they end up having the same menu. Now, this could be also be possible if we consider the same local common cause that this right restaurant on Bob's side also has the same menu. Now Alice goes to right and he goes to left. Again, they end up with same menu. That means all the restaurants have same menu if we are look, thinking in terms of a local common cause. Now, but the problem is when they go to, they both choose to go to the restaurant on the right side, they end up with different menu. How would you explain that? 
right first three can be dis uh, uh, explained by a local common cause and if that local common cause is to be true when they both go to the restaurant on the right side they should also end up with the same menu but they are not uh, uh, ending up with the same menu they are actually having the different menu now, this cannot be explained by any local kind of a correlation the meals of these two people are now not uh, correlated by local correlations the only way you can explain it by assuming something which is not local right not local non local is a something which is a negative assertion i don't know what non local is but i know that this is something which is not local when we say non local what we mean actually is not local so it's not local so it cannot be explained using local theory theory <coughs> based on that this simple uh, game uh, uh, is uh, 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 described here where x you can say that alice and y is bob and 0 0 is that x is equal to 0 means she goes to the left restaurant y is x is equal to 1 means that she goes to right restaurant and similarly for bob and whenever they choose left left their menu is same whenever they choose left and right their menu is same whenever they choose right and left their menu is same but whenever they choose right and right their menu is different exactly the same game as i have just described yeah i'm done actually so this this kind of effect can only be explained using effects which are not local and that is what we call as non local correlations that is where you can differentiate between local and non local correlations and non local correlations in general they are originated because of the entanglement between the particles so okay i hope it would have made some sense thank you thank you very much thank you professor atul kumar uh, let let me uh, briefly say uh, how it is related to philosophy of relation and what's the problem i mean that will be easier for geshela uh, he told that uh, the two entities they make a whole and uh, the two entities they lost their individuality so in a sense uh, the whole i mean entangled state contains more information than the individual thing entities so the issue is uh, if you think in terms of the relate and relation relata is plural i mean relatum two entities so they, they are relata and uh, relation the relation means between the two entities so issue is uh whether the relation is as real as relata first issue and second issue uh relation uh in the final analysis dharmakirti said it is not real but in our case in physics as it has been tested in lab experiment we say it is really real and the third issue how the two entities make a relation i mean the uh, prabhachandra he is a joint logician he entered in the debate and he he said the two entities have kind of propensity to make a relations so he told it is not reflected in dharmakirti work i am not Speci that specialist in dharma gritti sambandha pariksha uh, he debated with uh, buddhist scholars so we have a lot of these kind of issues come up uh, though uh, they they tried to explain technically but these are the issues the philosophers should take care and i hope geshela will take care of these issues geshela and i don't think he needs uh, any more introductions <coughs> uh thank you professor ccg
and all the um, my two colleagues here and all the participants so basically uh, the concept of relation is extremely important um, in every respect and uh, Buddhist philosophy Buddhist logic uh, attempts to articulate what the relationship is like so uh, we see that the um, reading uh, the different uh, traditions like Divitiums he talked about say the, the things, how the things related in ways of the, um, the resemblance and then the contiguity and the causal relation. And uh, he himself is not the, too happy with, uh, say, the predicting the future on the basis of what is today, what is current, or what is the events seen before. And um, the, say, in the higher tradition, Vaisheshi tradition, the non-Buddhist traditions in those days, that a hum great debate amongst uh, these traditions and the Buddhist uh, traditions pertaining to what the relationship is like. So the, when I speak about, say, the, the whole thing uh, comes into being, yes, of course, the, the relationship plays a very important role for the account of the memory how you account for the memory, again, the things that happened, that what you remember today, what happened in the past, there should be some connection there, some relation between what you remember now and the, the past event. So, on the, and likewise, we see that, for example, say, um, the, what I earlier this morning, I explained as the, say, a great painting of Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa painting, and there is a painting which is an undeniable fact, and the, this is, we can't say this, just a bunch of atoms. This is extremely expensive, the painting, and it can cost you like millions of dollars. Undeniable fact. Yet, if you go more closely, we see that, that it's just made of atoms. So the, where is that painting, this question? That was, was bothering all these, the, the logicians. Where is the painting? The undeniable, it's just, if it's just the bunch of atoms, then the, for most of us, we should know that the atoms, okay, the resonance, those who are below 30 years old, resonance, below 30, okay, below 30, and okay, let's say uh, 30 plus, right? Okay, so below 30, when I say below 30, the, those who are below 30, you are a little proud. Okay, we are young. Right, we are young. And plus that means that we are not too happy, right? Okay, so the point is that we are nothing but the, say, the age is related to your, I'm not saying age is a number, age is related to your body. Now the body is made of atoms. And the atoms which constitute who you are today, and the, say, if you are 30 plus, atoms which constitute the, those with 30 plus, those who are 30 plus, and the atoms which constitute those who are 30 below, age of the atoms are same, 15 billion years old. So, on that level, where is young, where is old? Okay, how many agree with me that with the atoms, there is no, there is no, uh, the annihilation of the atoms? Atoms, they can, at the most, they can change that, the energy, energy can convert into the atoms. They will never annihilate resent. If you know this, if you accept this from the physics point of view, then we have to acknowledge that all the atoms which constitute the body, they are all as old as 15 billion years ago. They came from the Big Bang. 15 billion years ago, which means that we are all, all the, on the, on the atomic level, we are all same age, we are all 17, 15 billion years ago. And more than the atoms, there's nothing to be identified as you as young or old, there's nothing. And that's the reality. So on that level, the atoms which constitute your body and the atoms which constitute the Mona Lisa beautiful painting, there's no difference. So Mona is a painting is extremely expensive and was the painting of the ordinary person like my painting, that painting which I do, is very cheap. 
So, but on the atomic level, there's no difference there. So, what is that reality which is so expensive as the Mona Lisa's painting? And you as a human being is so precious as the, say, if I damage your rock, no problem. If I damage your human life, you will be, you'll be going behind bars. So, there is this, in the, there is this, the, um, uh, the, the infallible reality there, reality of something which is expensive, something which is good, bad, cheap, and so forth. So where are these, this question? So on the atomic level, we see just that they are just the same, but there's something which is more than that. Where is it? Is it atoms are this? Or the, are they laid, are they just like, for example, like this, this cloth, or the, let's say this, uh, this clock, watch, and the cloth covers it, so there's something uh, the different that the the cloth which covers the clock, the watch, these are two different entities, and these two are related in that sense, or no, it's just the same object seen in two different ways. So, what is that relationship? There's a relationship there between these atoms which constitute the the Mona Lisa painting. What is that relationship? This is a huge. Uh, discussion, uh, the discussion debate going between the different Buddhist, the different logical traditions in the past, particularly Acharya Dharmakirti and the, his counterparts like the Nyaya tradition and the Vaishish tradition and so forth. So as Professor Cicero indicated that the, um, said that that relationship that relation between the Mona Lisa painting and what constitutes the atoms which constitute the Mona Lisa painting, that relationship is something not as um, the same, uh, not as um, substantially real entity, but when you speak about it, it is not intrinsic or the, the intrinsic, this is something we have to study in more detail of the different philosophical traditions, Buddhist tradition, traditions. And of course, this is something not confined to Buddhism. Non Buddhists also, but I think that we ne really need to say the peel off the different layers, understanding what constitutes the objective reality. So, with this in mind, and the um, so this when talking about the, the relationship is primarily discussed in Acharya Dharmakirti's text, a seventh century gradient master. So, there he talked primarily of the two kinds of relationship one is the causal relationship, and the other one is the same entity relationship. And of course, this relationship per se is the unlike the, the relator and the relation. The, the, unlike the, the relator, the things which are involved in this relationship, for example, like, let's say, the, the, the atoms which constitute that, the, the painting of Mona Lisa, and the painting per se, the painting, of Mona Lisa and the atoms which constitute the pain of the Mona Lisa. What's the relationship? The relationship, we see that to speak of the relationship, there are two things. One is the atoms which constitute the pain of the, the Mona Lisa and the other one is the pain of the Mona Lisa which is on the macro level and the the individual parts like the atoms on the macro level. So there are two things that these two are the relator and then what connects the two is the relationship. So what is that relationship? So the relator, according to Acharya Dharmagirdi, that is something very substantial there. We can see the Mona Lisa painting there. And I think that like maybe a few years ago, that Mona Lisa painting it said that it was lost. It was stolen away by somebody else. And so it was completely there as an object of reality from the Acharya Dharmagirdi's point of view. And then the, likewise, the atoms also there, atoms which constitute the painting. There's all, this is also the object, the substantial there. But the relationship between the two, that is something not as substantial as the, the relator, the two things involved in the relation. So what is that like? So for the Nyaya and Vaibhish, the Vaisheshik, this is amazing. How the different philosophical traditions, they speak about the, the relationship. The relation. Yes, the, the painting is undeniably there. Atoms are undeniably there. So, what is the relationship between them? Are they like the same entity or are they like two different entities? Like, so my hand covered by the cloth, these are two, remove the cloth, and my hands are intact there. 
So likewise, remove the painting and the atoms are left there. No. If you remove the painting, the atoms are gone. Or the atoms are removed, the painting is gone. So the, the two are not seen as two distinct entities. Whereas the Vaisheshiks and the Nyaya, they cannot conceive of anything existing, the independent, anything existing as the dependent on the mind. Things should be so solidly there. Because of which, and for them, the, it is their philosophical position, logical assertion, that uh, the, the two things, they are related in ways as two diff distinct entities, not as the same, the single entity. But Sachura Tharmagata says, no, this relationship is purely mental destination. The monolith of pain is there, and the atoms are there, and the atom, the monolith of pain is not different from the atoms. These two are the same entity. And these two are related in ways as the same entity relationship. It's not as a different relationship. And the, the more discussion is about what exactly is this relation, the relationship, this phenomenon of relationship. It, is that something as substantial as the, the relator or it's more non-substantial? Answer is, of course, non-substantial. And non-substantial non doesn't mean that it doesn't exist intrinsically. Because for Acharya Dharmagirti, according to Acharya Dharmagirti, anything that exists should necessarily exist as intrinsically, but not as substantially real. The, so for Acharya Dharmagirti, the, the phenomena, they classified into two categories. One is substantially existent and one is impurely existent. Impurely existent doesn't mean that things exist uh, at the devoid of intrinsic reality. What exists should necessarily exist as intrinsically, and um, the for Acharya Dharmakirti. But for Prasanga, that's very different. Okay. So with this in mind, we see that there, there are two kinds of relationship and which is totally uh, the uh, not acceptable to uh, David Hume. In fact, for David Hume, why I'm the bringing this David Hume is because that the when I was in Cambridge, the there was one I say it was very interesting uh, the story that a lady was always coming on the same bus as I was, the bus which I catch, and then the Britishers. Is there any, any Britishers here? Uh, they, they, their style is very different from the Americans. Americans, they will just laugh and smile at you. And the Britishers, they remain very reserved. And all of the, like, almost for one month, we're together in this, on the same bus, but they never talked. And suddenly one day, I was on the seat, and then that same lady who was a little older, maybe like 10 years older than me, sat right next to me, which is so unconventional. And I was a little st stiff, and she said, Are you Geshe Damdil? And I was shocked, a little shocked. I said, Yes. Then she said, My husband wants to invite you for a cup of tea. Who is your husband? I said that he's a professor of philosophy. And later on, I came to discover that he was the chief editor of the Encyclopedia of Philosophy of Cambridge University. Amazing, humble, extremely learned. And then I asked him, it was just my this initial exposure to the outside world. After completing my Geshe degree and then sent to Cambridge, and uh, the obviously meeting with lots of professors and experts, physicists. And then they, I asked him, if I were to, to read Western philosophy, which book should be the, the first book to read? And he said, David Hume. And he so kindly offered, gave me his own personal copy of the David Hume's the book. So there, reading that, I see that the David Hume's present is very different. He don't really, he doesn't really accept in things that we can predict in the future that what's going to happen in the future on the basis of what we can see today. So he doesn't really accept any of these things. Of course, similar of this kind is what we find presented in Buddhist the logic as well. So in other words, uh, they uh, say there's mention of the, the causal relationship, which means that the results, the coming being, but depends on the early causes. These two are related, just to connect it, related. And then like the, the same nature, meaning the two relata existing at the same time, uh, the, 
painting of the Mona Lisa and the atoms which constitute the painting. You have two minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then, the, uh, for example, yourself and your body, your mind, these were related in the form of same dependency, the, the same nature. Next one is something which is very unique of Prasangika. Prasangika talks about the, see, the phenomenon of dependence, the phenomenon of support, and the phenomenon of contact. These are seen as the same. So our job is to see if uh, these three, which, which Prasangika presents as the, in the form of the dependent, phenomenon of dependency, um, the where, which of the two things, or do they go in that direction, but may not necessarily be one of these two, the cause relationship or the same entity relationship. And then the, um, okay, so one thing that I would say is that of the two relationships, one is a causal relationship, we see that one is the law of karma, which is extremely important. Why the causal relationship, this causal relationship is so important is that it's on this basis that there are many of the important concepts of Buddhism, not only Buddhism, even physics, and the even the Western science or in even the any the systems of Hinduism, Jainism or Christianity even. So many of the concepts are the built on the concept of the cause and effect relationship. And the law of karma, which we talk about in Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, is all on the basis of the uh, the this concept. And then the concept of rebirth, how we can account for the rebirth. So it's again uh, postulated on the basis of this. And the next thing is about the same entity relationship. Um, in this connection, we see that the, for example, the, the non-locality and so forth, which I presented in this early this, uh, this morning session also, is that where the, the, on the micro level, the relationship, the same nature relationship, particularly with your, uh, with your energy and your mind, subtle mind and subtle energy, these two are related in ways of same nature which is not acceptable in the sutra system. Whereas in the tantra system, uh, that is something which is so unique with the physical body and the mind, physical body in the sense of the energy, and the mind which is totally cognitive, uh, these two, or experiential form, these two can, they, these two actually exist as the same nature. It is on this basis that the, all these non-locality, the behavior of non-locality on the, the micro level, when he trained on this, trained in the subtle energy and the subtle mind, then all these strange behaviors can be seen, can be made visible, on, also on the, not only training in the micro, but the behaviors can be manifested on the macro level. Okay, so, so basically, um, the, to make it quick, relationship between karma and the habit, this is a very complicated thing, how your karma and the karma which is purely mental with your physical body, the physical abode, the world in which you live, your house and so forth, external world and the internal world of the karma, how these two are related. This is a huge question and then the um, say this can best be explained only when you understand the mechanism of how the energy which is the, the subtle energy, which is not visible even to the science. Subtle energy, how they can affect the physiological energy on the physiological level. So which is visible to the uh, neuroscientists or neurologists. And then from there, can then affect the physical external body. This can affect the external world. So this is how best can be explained from the point of view of the uh, the um, subtle energy and subtle mind in the form of the same entity, same entity in the relationship. Whereas if these two are co totally uh, different, then how the the karmas they they connect you to the respective world system and so forth. This becomes a very complicated thing. Then training the subtle energy and the mind for super mundane, simultaneous, diverse activities, mean non-local activities in different locations, and then finally. Finally, our job is what we say this, the mind and your, the energy and your subtle mind, this have, these, these two have incredible potential, potential if manifested in its true form, true form, you don't have to have to have any fear. The fear of all these things are attracted when this, the mind which feels a fear, it takes a very different form affected by external 
factors. When you see that, you can train the subtle energy and subtle mind so well, so that it can manifest in its true form, then uh, the external factors cannot affect you at all. It is at this point that your mind will be liberated, that you experience infinite happiness and total fearlessness. Thank you so much. Thank you, Geshida. We have uh, many, many philosophical questions related to this. So uh, let us go to the young scholars who have uh, any question. Please raise your hands. OK, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. So I have one question regarding uh, the, let's take the example of uh, Schrodinger's cat. Uh, it's not directly related to the quantum entanglement, but maybe you have some thoughts. Uh, so when you take Schrodinger's cat, for example, we say that we close the box, and then after a while, we say that the cat is in a super, uh, superposition state. But for us, he's in a superposition state. The cat itself probably knows if well, it doesn't know, but for, uh, inside the box, the cat knows, like, either alive or dead, right? Uh, so my question is, from a, a quantum physics point of view, can we say, or is there a mention that for, for one person who doesn't know the information, uh, the cat is in superposition, but from inside where you have the information, there is no superposition. So how can one cat be both in superposition from the outside, but not in superposition from the inside? This is my question. Sure. I can. See, when, when you look at uh, uh, the uh, particles and at microscopic level, that's what I said, that when you're talking about uh, an electron, right? An electron can be in an arbitrary linear superposition of zero and one. So if you could see electron also doesn't know whether it is zero or one, like you said, cat knows whether it's dead or alive, right? For in macro world that happens, cat knows whether it's uh, dead or alive. As an observer from outside, I don't know or the example that I have given you for the red or orange boxes, right? The balls in the, those two boxes, Ellis and Bob doesn't know. They might be thinking what color that they are going to get, but I know, right? And in this case, what you're talking about, if it's an atom or an electron, electron also doesn't know until unless you ask that question. When you ask the, that question, you are forcing the electron to take a stand that uh, whether it is spin up or spin, down. Okay, so any other question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, many psychiatrists and many psychologists have done research on reincarnation. For example, uh, Ian Stevenson, uh, Jim Tucker, uh, and uh, they were able to scientifically validate through many cases uh, this phenomena of the law of karma or rebirth or reincarnation. And this is one of the uh, central tenet of Buddhist philosophy as well. Now, is it possible that we can relate these phenomena with the idea of quantum non-locality in the sense that things of the past, which has no, I mean, spatial present now, can impact me as a human being? So can that be considered as a, I mean, no? So, uh, On based on material body, the whole system is based on physical body, and uh, the rebirth system is uh, so the tr there are two different uh, physical bodies. So unless you have a concept of mind, when we talk about you know in tantra, the subtle wind and things, 
like subtle senses and things like that. That's a different thing. But uh, in general case, the, you know, the, it is a mental continuum that goes from one life to another life. Yeah, just to respond, uh, just in two okay. statements, okay. Uh, is not the body essentially a projection of the mind? I mean, in, in terms of physics, we say that, uh, well, uh, the mind is the field part and the body is the matter part, and, but the fundamental aspect is the mind. So body is essentially the projection of the mind. So body and mind are essentially the aspects There is no physical continuity. No, you've been. Yeah. So, if if I may ask, is the body housed in the mind? You know, in terms of the physics, it's very difficult question. We don't know what mind is. All right. Okay. Yeah. Here in science, uh, brain. And yeah. The brain stops here, and you bring it home. No, one of my uh, very good friends is a world famous neuroscientist called Pribram. He passed away a few years before. He used to sit next to my office in USA. So every week he used to come to my office and he asked, Is here, where is my mind? We don't know. I mean, whether it is in neuronal architecture or where. We are not able to locate it till now. So, any other question? <laughs> if not, I have uh, something uh, for my clarification, of course, from uh, young people's clarifications also. Like, uh, you are talking about uh, causal relations. But here, the non-local relations in quantum theory, they are a causal. They are not causal relations. But again the question comes, how do you define causality? There are two ways, one in Einsteinian sense, which means that according to Einstein's special theory of relativity, the speed of the propagation of the light is constant and maximum, 3 into 10 to the power 10 centimeter per second. So based on that, we formulate a causality principle this is called Einsteinian causality. And according to that formulation, the non-locality which makes a correlation or relation between two entities are a causal. But as Nicholas Jisho, you know him, he suggested that maybe uh, this kind of phenomena have an explanation if we change the concept of space-time is different from Einstein. So whether my question is to you, whether a causality also may create a relation. A causality. Yeah. Causality. No, a causality. Uh -huh. A causality, whether that is also a kind of relation. Okay. So basically, um, uh, see, we talked about the two kinds of relation. And then the, um, so one thing which is, which the non-locality or the quantum entanglement to, uh, which is being discussed. This is something which I said that it would for sure fall under the category of the conventional truth, uh, but not in form of ultimate truth. At the same time, we see that these two are connected. Although physically these two are not at all connected, still we see that these two are connected in ways. So therefore, which I think some of the physicists would describe that as a spooky action at distance. So these two are connected, but then the physically speaking, there's nothing to say that these two are connected. But then these two are connected, behave like this so teleportation. So the idea is that the they say that the as I said earlier this morning, that the when you train your mind on the subtle level, then the the even the, the physical body can be affected. Can be affected, and this cannot be explained in ways that they are like the physically connected in, in ways of, uh, through the, for example, so what is happening there in the other the, the part of the Milky Way galaxy. You can see through, through only through the medium of the light. 
He should be the medium to connect the two. So likewise, do we require such a physical entity to connect the two things that two, the two things are related? So of course, in the uh, training or the very subtle, the mind and subtle energy, but then the actual manifestation can happen on the macro level that the two things can manifest as totally unconnected, but they're connected. Physically not connected, but connected. So this, of course, requires training in the subtle mind. So, so these phenomena are actually there. For example, Acharya Dharmagati, who explained the two kinds of the, the relationship. So he acknowledges this phenomena, this phenomena. So there, then the, from the, as you said, so now the question comes, so if, like Acharya Dharmaki, the brilliant logician and psychologist, and ex accepts this phenomena of the non-locality on that level, uh, that this, the two things are not connected physically, but still they behave connected. So how do you explain this? So then the answer comes in the subtle mind. So as you said, what is mind? Nobody knows. So this is where the, we have to know what mind is. So there is, a, there is this phenomena of mind. Without accepting the phenomena of mind, then the, say, even the neuroscience, you will come across many shortcomings, crisis there. For example, in the 2019, we had a huge conference on consciousness organized by one brilliant neuroscientist, a very senior neuroscientist, and attended by many neuroscientists, physicists, psychologists, and I was invited as one of the presenters from the psychology, the psychology part of view. And one neuroscientist talked talk about the free will. And the question simply bombarded this lady neuroscientist that if you accept the, if you talk about the, say, number one neuroscience, the word free will, on the other hand, you're talking about the, say, the workings of the mind um, the reduced to the workings of the brain. In other words, if you take the reductionist approach of the workings of the mind to the brain, then how can you explain the free will? Because on the level of the, the brain, purely mechanical, um, it is to be deterministic. There's no room for free will. Then all these debates, the, she, she was just attacked by all the questions. And the, it's all because that one fails to account for many of the phenomena which actually exist. Um, only when you accept the phenomena of mind, then these can be resolved. If you don't accept this, if you reduce everything to the brain, then you will be left with the explanatory vacuum of the gap. So the next question is, what is mind? So for this, we have to have, again, and at the thorough studies, as explained by Acharya Dharmagiri himself, what the mind is, this is all very thoroughly explained. It would be good if we can have such conferences on, you know, what is the exact mind? There are two empirically, empirical explanation. Not like, you know, there's a mind, you know, we cannot experience it. Not like that, something which we can explain the empirically. So that is something which is required for such conferences. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Once again, all the speakers. Now, we are finishing the session now. Okay. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, sir, please, 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 I'll just conclude. This. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Sisi Raji, for chairing the session and our speakers uh, for your very insightful presentation and answers. Uh, with this, uh, we have come to the end of the uh, session. So I would like to invite uh, Venerable Professor Keshen Samdala to the stage uh, to kindly present the souvenirs and kata to our esteemed uh, chairperson and speakers. Thank you. Uh, Professor Sisi Raiji, our chairperson. Uh, Venerable Keshito Jidamjula. Uh, Professor Adul Kumarji. And uh, 
Professor Utkarsh Mishra ji. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, with this, we are done with this uh, second session. Now, the next session will be uh, moderated by moderated by my colleague uh, Ms. Kama Zumbala. Uh, so please be seated, and the next session will be resumed shortly. Thank you.